Hey, this is Mike McAdam from Gen X Guitar. Today I'm doing my top 10 countdown by year of the best guitar albums from the 80s. This is gonna be fun. Okay, so what I did with this list, and obviously we're gonna keep it to mostly hard rock type stuff to keep it on brand with the channel, but I picked one album per year, which was absolutely brutal in some cases to do. Um, I may do a separate list of just generic top 10 guitar albums of the 80s, but by picking only one per year, it made it a lot more difficult. So let's start with this. All right, so 1980, is there any doubt? Back in Black by ACDC. Maybe the best album of their career. Actually, I think it's Highway to Hell, but that's a different list for another time. But for 1980 or 1980s ACDC, there's no doubt it's going to be Back in Black. So many classic riffs and songs on this record. Um, I really think you can make an argument the band was at its absolute peak at this point. Um, Angus was just ripping off some awesome solos. Uh, just too many good tunes for this to not be you know, the best guitar album of that year. Obviously, Blizzard of Oz from Ozzy gets a notable mention, as well as a few other albums, but we only had one that we could pick, and it was Back in Black. 1981. Wait for it. Fair Warning by Van Halen. This one was easy. Um, like a lot of other guitar players, I know the first album has a certain iconic status, but I think 1981's Fair Warning was Eddie as, at his absolute best. It's really a great combination of his playing. Still had a lot of the early rawness at that point, but he had refined it and started to develop some different ideas, some different textures. Now you start hearing more of like this kind of Alan Holdsworth influence that's in his playing at that point. Um, my favorite Van Halen guitar album and his tone, it just hit another level on that album. The production in general, actually, like the bass is much more present. The drums have a better sound to them. Uh, just a great, great guitar album, and I think Eddie's absolute best, and my best for 1981, Van Halen's Fair Warning. Okay, 1982. This year was hard for me, I'm going to be honest with you. So I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here with my pick, and I have an honorable mention. So, 1982, Ozzy's Speak of the Devil. I'm going to go to bat for this album because a lot of people don't know about it. Uh, Brad Gillis is the guitarist who later went on with Night Ranger to do some great stuff with them. I think his guitar sound on this album is awesome. I actually think in a lot of ways it's better than Randy's. It's really full and just ballsy and um, his playing on this record is great. There's a looseness to this album because I guess the band only had a very short amount of time to learn these songs. And it's far from perfect, which is part of why I liked it. Of course, Ozzy went and redubbed his vocals in the studio as he's been known to do. But the music just has a certain rawness and explosiveness to it, to it that I really like. And Brad's playing on this album is awesome. Uh, my notable mention was IOU by Alan Holdsworth. Um, love this record, but... I had to give the nod to Ozzy Speak of the Devil. This particular year was really hard for me to come up with a solid choice, but that is mine, 1982 Speak of the Devil from Ozzy Osbourne. Okay, 1983. Um, I am going to go with Stevie Ray Vaughan's Texas Flood. Um, I think Texas Flood was probably his best overall record. He would go on to do some other great stuff. But I think Stevie Ray is one of those players where... Kind of like Van Halen and maybe some other people, like the first time you heard him was maybe the best. And his playing on that record, it's such a solid record. Um, the tunes are great throughout. Um, there really isn't a lot of filler. I think just he did that thing incredibly well. And I think Texas Flood was the best record that captured that. Um, obviously, it got more song-oriented and things changed a little bit over time. But I think his playing was really, you know, at its peak on this record. Uh, notable mention is Billy Idol's Rebel Yell album. I think Steve Stevens is a really underrated player. And I think his playing on this record in particular was outstanding. Really cool textural parts that fit in the context of those songs really elevated them. Uh, so I really liked that record a lot, but I had to give it to one and it was Stevie Ray's Texas Flood. All right, 1984, again, difficult year, but I'm giving it to Rats Out of the Cellar. Uh, to this day, I still love the guitar playing on this album. 
Warren D. Martini was like 20 when he cut this, and uh, I think in a lot of ways it was the peak of his playing. I would have liked to have seen him go more in that direction, but it seems like every record afterwards... I mean, I give him credit. His playing got a little slower, a little more tasteful, a little more fit in with the song. You know, this album, he's really shredding a lot, and just the solos are nuts, and the phrasing in his solos is really unique and really um, individual. You know, you can hear Van Halen influence, you can hear George Lynch influence, some Randy Rhodes, but just some of the bends he does, some of the long legato type lines, uh, really difficult to copy. I've heard some people do it, but it's really hard to get that kind of playing. I also think it was by far Rat's best album as far as the songs, the arrangements were more uh, put together. It just sounds like they took the time to get all of it right. I think Warren's playing really shines. I think You're in Trouble is just such an awesome solo. Um, in Your Direction is great. Um, just the whole record, uh, really excellent. And Robin Crosby's playing is cool too, although he plays a lesser role on the album. So 1984, Out of the Cellar by Rat. I did have Yngwie Malmsteen's Rising Force and I was really, I had to go back and look at this online and be like, please come out in 1985. But it came out in 84, so only one of them was able to stick. But I think Ingve, similar to Rat, to me, his playing on that album was the best I'd ever heard it. It just seems like everything he did after that was kind of a variation on it. But I think when that record came out, um, I was just blown away by a guy being able to do that. And I think... The songs on that record and his playing was just really raw and hungry. Um, that's why I lean towards that one. So 1985, this is another really hard year, uh, but I did come up with one. This is Metal Fatigue by Alan Holdsworth. And this is an album that a lot of big name players name check as one of their favorite. It's one of his more listenable albums. Some of Alan Holdsworth's stuff is not as easy on the ears if you're into like rock and metal and stuff. But I think this album was a little more commercial. If you haven't checked it out, it's maybe a good place to start to check out some of his playing. Um, just incredible long legato lines like a saxophone player really crossed over well into rock um, where players were starting to pick that sound up and add it to their playing. So that is Metal Fatigue, my 1985 pick from Alan Holdsworth. 1986, I think a lot of people, as well as myself, were introduced to Steve Vai with Eat Him and Smile by David Lee Roth. That is my pick for 1986. Um, coming up with this video, I recently re-listened to that record. And Vai's playing has just so much personality to it and so much individualness to it where it's just uniquely him. And I think there's some humor to it and there's some virtuosity to it. And I think that record is aged really well. Um, there's so many records, if you put them on, you're like, oh my God, that sounds so 1980s. That record really doesn't sound like that. I think it just sounds like a great rock album. I mean, it does sound of its time, but it, it's unique in that regard. And I think Vi really showcases a lot of different things. Um, Ladies Night in Buffalo is a cool solo where it's loose but it has some you know virtuosic parts in it it's interesting reading ted templeman's book how he talks about he made vi basically use just that one track because i guess steve wanted to overdub all kinds of stuff but that album has aged really well for me uh, 1986 eat em and smile by david lee roth featuring steve vi so as a side note i thought about for a half joke putting on vinnie vincent invasions album I have to admit, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. There's some great songs in that album. It's not a particularly well-recorded record. I wonder if a remix or a re-something, insert joke here, um, might help that album. But, I mean, it's just complete shredding on every song. Everything is way over the top. 14-year-old me loved it. Maybe not so much now, but that was an album I had put under consideration. All right, 1987. Tribute by Ozzy Osbourne. I had to get Randy Rhodes in here on s some way. He was bumped off in 81 by Fair Warning, bumped off in 80 by Back in Black, but not anymore. He takes the number one spot. Um, I think Randy's playing is great on this album. So sad that he gave us such little recorded work, but I think Tribute is a really good kind of one-stop shopping for hearing what he did. Um, his interpretations of a lot of those Ozzy studio tracks live I think come off really well 
and I think his playing is fantastic on the whole album. It's interesting to hear his spin on some of the Sabbath tunes as well. Um, supposedly he wasn't a huge fan of Sabbath, um, so he takes some liberties with some of those tunes. And contextually, it's just interesting to hear. Always loved that album. I did put Appetite for Destruction as a second. Could have easily put that one number one, but I felt like I had to get Randy in there somewhere. So Appetite obviously completely changed everything as far as you know the type of songs that Guns N' Roses were putting out at that point. And Slash's guitar playing is great throughout. I think it's aged really well. So that was a tough one, but I did pick Tribute by Randy Rhodes, Ozzy Osbourne as my number one pick. All right, 1988. I'm going to pick Nothing Shocking by Jane's Addiction. Uh, when this record came out, it completely flipped me upside down because a lot of the stuff Dave Navarro was doing on that record were things that I was trying to do as a guitarist, but he was much more developed and had it put together. Um, I love, he had clearly one foot in a lot of classic rock, like you can hear his Hendrix influences and a lot of the classic rock stuff, but he had a lot of this um, kind of textural, a lot of these textural things that he would do um, that made his playing sonically very interesting. I love that record. I still love it um, in terms of how he built up a lot of those tracks um, it was just very interesting to listen to, but it just also had that rock punch to it. Great album for my 1988 pick. One album I had thought of putting in this spot was Greg Howe's debut album. Uh, another album that, you know, was on an indie label. It wasn't recorded particularly well, but I think his playing was outstanding on that whole record. The songs are really good. I think he was a good combination of a guy that was a shredder and had the chops but he had a lot of musicality and a lot of writing ability on that record that really elevated it. Um, but I had to give the nod to Nothing Shocking. So that's my number one pick for 1988. And my last one for 1989, it's Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop. Uh, this was a big comeback album for Beck. Um, he kind of went back more into the kind of instrumental stuff that he started with Blow by Blow into Wired and There and Back. Um, but he really brought it into the 80s and that particular group, they had great synergy. Doug, who shoots these videos, and I were lucky enough to see him and Stevie Ray Vaughan that year on tour. That was a great show and obviously we didn't know that Stevie Ray would die the year afterwards, but uh, Jeff Beck really, you know, just elevated everything on that record so much. Um, it was really a return to form. I mean, he never lost his form, but you know what I mean. And uh, that is my number one pick for 1989, Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop. Okay, so obviously these picks are mine and people are going to have different opinions on them. Like I said, we really tried to keep it more to the kind of hard rock genre that we've been covering on this channel. In the meantime, comment below. Let me know what you think of my list. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing so we can keep making more content like this. Thank you for watching Gen X Guitar and I'll see you in the next video. What about White Snake's White Snake album? Still the night? Come on, man. Oh, I didn't. I didn't forget about it. Believe me. Um, the sin of that record is you have half the public that still thinks, you know, the guys in the video or the guys in the band. Um, so John Sykes. I mean, his playing, his writing on that album was awesome. So I definitely didn't forget about it. But that's what makes this list brutal. I mean, there's only one that's going to go, and that that album could have easily been on there for '87. I, I do have some uh, thoughts. I mean, Appetite for Destruction, I mean, they were just absolutely huge. And the songs in there are crazy good. No, they're amazingly good. And you know what? I remember having this discussion. Do you remember that Swedish guy Mike you lived with? My roommate? Yeah. Yeah, of course. So he was like, you know, this is like 1991. He's like, Slash sucks. Blah, blah, blah. You know, because it was all like fusion or whatever for him. And you know what? Sorry, Mike. I think I won that argument. Like, I think Slash playing is, you know, it, it, Slash is awesome. I mean, and, and, he has he has a feel that's just yeah. uh, it, it's hard to describe. I mean, he and that's the thing. Like, you know, you started having like all these kind of guitar Olympics guys, and then this guy comes out with like more of a '70s style. I mean, I almost put you know the first Badlands album on my 1989 list because. Um, I think Jakey Lee was kind of like, okay, you know, I could shred an Aussie, but 
I'm really more of like a classic rock type guitarist. And that was another record that kind of took a left turn from the whole shredder thing. So yeah, I, you know, that was 87 was a tough one. I had to get the Randy one in there though. What happened to 5150? 50, 50, you know, look, 5150, I could make an argument that was Eddie's least impressive album of that decade, guitar playing wise. Well, and we're, we're just looking at it guitar wise. Well, we're just looking guitar wise. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, just, you know, 5150 was, you know, a little, little underwhelming in that regard. Yeah, if you're just going just straight guitar wise, no, I get it. But still a great album. No, it's it's a totally great album, and you know, at some point, I've seen people. We could talk about this more. Like, pick one: "Eat 'Em or Smile," "Eat 'Em and Smile," or Fifty One Fifty. I think the songs on Fifty One Fifty are great, and they've stood up really well. But you know, yeah, it wasn't. You know, Ed at that point seemed like okay. I'm more in the keyboards. I'm more in the writing tunes. The guitar is kind of a secondary part of it now. Yeah. I think uh, I would have to agree with uh, Jane's Addiction. That was a huge game changer. Well, for me personally, it was a game changer. Yeah. You know, really cool stuff on there. I remember when that record came out, I was almost looking for, okay, where's Guitar Player Magazine, like, jumping on this album? Because back then, you would listen to a record, and then, okay, interview with Reb Beach or whoever. Like, you know, you'd see Winger on TV. Wow, that guy kicks ass on guitar. Then there's interviews with them. And I kept waiting for that, for Jane's Addiction, and it didn't happen on that record. And to me, I was like, wow, this, this guy's playing is really awesome. But again, it wasn't that shredder. Like, I mean, he could play, but it was more like 70s rock wailing than, than you know, 80s shredder stuff. But that was the album, I think, that really brought us together, from what I remember. We just had that, you know, bonding point, if you will. Yeah, I you know that's funny that you mentioned that. That's that's true. Like, I know a guy who saw them on that tour, and he was just saying, you know, he didn't know who they were, but they came out and played up the beach and just like blew this place up. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was envious. I'm like, man, I would have loved to seen them in that era. 